Next up is Karen Carneal Tambor, who is the co CIO of sustainability at Bridgewater. She's also a member of the executive committee, the investment committee, and is a partner at Bridgewater. The recent macro volatility has been giving me flashbacks to 2007 and 8, uh, when I think most everybody at Treasury, US Treasury and the Fed and a number of financial participants were reading the Bridgewater's daily observations every day. And they ended up calling it extremely well was my memory of it. Karen worked there at the time and later ran that group. I know we have a lot of stock pickers in the audience today at Sohn, and I res and many of them don't weight the macro. And I, I, I respect that discipline. But I also always think of a friend of mine who says that it, if you don't do macro, macro will do you. Karen, over to you. Hi, Graham. Thanks for having me. So given that most people at this conference are speaking about individual companies and their attractiveness, I thought that the way I would talk about the macro perspective is to share with you my worries about corporate profitability. And I come at corporate, corporate profitability from a very macro perspective as a macro investor at Bridgewater, but also from a very nuts and bolts perspective of how corporate profits really get made across the economy as a whole. Let me first just put one quick slide on the screen. I'm only going to show one chart, which is that people may or may not be aware that U.S. corporate profits are currently at the highest level they've really ever been. Um, so you can see here, multi, multi-decade highs uh, relative to the size of the economy. So I'm gonna cover four things. How do these profits work? How did we get here? The turning point we're currently in and what that means for investors. So let me start with how it currently works, which is, this may sound really basic, but for a business to grow its profit margin, it has to simply raise revenue or get people to pay for its products without paying labor everything that it got through revenue. And for one business, that might seem obvious, straightforward, but when you actually think about it for the entire economy, it's not as simple because if you add up all the workers, you know, everyone's spending is somebody's income. And so you need to find a way for basically all the workers in the economy to pay for your goods without actually earning that money and in income. And of course, there are ways to do that. Most importantly, leverage, borrowing, spending down your savings. And so, for example, households can go and take out a mortgage, spend on their credit card, use their savings. And that would be kind of a bulk of money that goes into profits because you didn't have to pay those people out in wages and yet they bought their stuff. Businesses can do the same thing when they create capital expenditures because often they go and borrow to do those capital expenditures. And now the person that sells them equipment or whatever it is they need for the CapEx got this money without having someone, no one in the economy had to pay those people wages that came out of borrowing. And of course the government can increase the deficit, can reduce the deficit and do those sorts of things. Now that's a mechanical answer, right? These are all people, governments, individuals, businesses, they have to choose to borrow for a reason. And so they have to come out there and choose to make these decisions. And what happens is that a lot of these kind of vague, broad ideas like globalization and deregulation, they end up being the impetus to go do that. And so that takes us to sort of how we got here. What happened in terms of how we got here is in the decades leading up to the financial crisis, um, basically you had very significant secular forces that um, were things like globalization picking up and making it so businesses could afford to just, you know, move their employees to cheaper places abroad, a lot of deregulation, um, the fact that there are fewer and fewer labor unions, you basically had these structural forces that reduced a lot of workers bargaining power and made kind of a set of circumstances where people don't just want to stop spending because their wages are lower, they want to keep spending, there was a desire to go find a way to lever up and bring more money into the economy that would be spent on things, but not paid out in wages. Now, of course, if everybody in the world wants to borrow at the same time, rates would usually rise. But what happened prior to the financial crisis is that there was a lot of desire from emerging markets, particularly China and oil producers. They wanted to save in dollars. They wanted to collect these sort of, you know, huge piles of reserves. And so they practically came in, wanted to save in dollars, drove interest rates down. And that whole process of lowering the interest rates, interest rates constantly falling, supported people being able to borrow and basically then support profits by having this pool of money that was not paid for them through wages that they could spend on corporate products. Then the financial crisis hits. 
And that, of course, changed. And so a lot of the borrowing that was done, whether it's housing and subprime, couldn't really be done anymore. And you kind of ended this era of significant private sector leveraging that we lived through. And instead, the government stepped in. There was some back and forth, you know, the government did more, and then the private sector got better, and then it did less. But big picture, I'd say that in this period, it wasn't that effective per dollar what the government did, because a lot of what ended up happening happened through quantitative easing. And we all know quantitative easing, lots of money is printed. Lots of people get that money, but really it drives up financial assets. And wealthy people own financial assets disproportionately. And when a wealthy person has their stock prices go up a little bit, they don't just spend every dollar of that extra money. And so not that effective and really brought to extremes things like inequality. And so pre-COVID, I'd say we were kind of at this like turning point where we were kind of at extremes. Corporate profits were extremely high, the highest we'd ever seen. Inequality was extremely high. We printed all this money. Rates were already zero. It was sort of a breaking point of the paradigm we, we knew. Then COVID hit. And what COVID could have done is made all this a lot worse. Because of course, COVID hit workers disproportionately, poor people disproportionately, that doesn't have health care, that's who gets fired. And what happened instead was something extremely curious we've basically never seen which is at the same time the economy collapsed, corporate profits actually surged to new highs. Now that doesn't usually happen. How did that happen? How could corporate profits disconnect to this extent from what was happening in the US economy? And the reason was the government stepped in in a much more direct and clever and sort of dollar effective way, which is at the same time that companies fired people and you had unemployment or underemployed people. So they were just paying out less of their workers. The government gave people a significant amount of money that actually more than offsets all the wages that they lost for most of the economy, certainly the bottom 60, 80 percent. So you have this you know, kind of extreme case where businesses aren't paying people, but households keep all their spending power, even though they're not getting paid wages. They're just getting all this money from the government, literally checks coming into their house. So even though they did a lot of savings and also put a lot of money into the stock market and crypto, they also could keep spending on corporate goods without actually getting paid out in wages, which is pretty much the perfect equation for unbelievably corporate high profits. And that's how we end up with historically high profits we've never seen before unprecedented. And what's amazing is we did it without hurting household balance sheets. Opposite, you know, the, the bottom 60 or 80% of households had the fastest healing in balance sheets we've ever seen. In a very, very fast period of time, they got these big checks, they suddenly had this huge pool of savings, very, very healthy balance sheets very quickly. Okay, that brings us to today and today's turning point. And I think today we're at a pretty significant turning point where these record high corporate profitability numbers are being threatened from a lot of different perspectives. And it all comes back down to sort of how will corporates be able to keep people spending so much more money than they're paying them out in wages. And so the first thing we all know is government's not sending people any more checks. And so we all got check in the mail. That's not happening again. That's behind us. Now, what's already been happening is that households were in such good shape. They got so much money from the government that they kind of didn't hesitate. When the money stopped coming in, they felt pretty comfortable saying, you know what? I'll just lower my savings rates. I'll just make it up via whether it just save less or literally put money in my credit card. Credit card borrowing is you know, kind of exploding. And so the last couple months, not many months, but two, three months of spending have been totally, totally funded by households basically dissaving rather than a big growth of income, because even though they're getting a lot of income from the private sector, the government is pulling back at the same time. And so that is pretty unlikely to sustain or at least go faster, giving you know, more corporate profits, more fuel to this fire, because you already have pretty low savings rates. And at the same time, this insane boom that all these checks set off and the fact that everyone could spend so much money is creating inflation. And of course, rates are rising. And we already have the biggest rise in mortgage rates in decades, very, very fast, very, very rapid, falling asset prices. This isn't going to be the time that households choose. Now I want to just save even more. Now I want to lever up. Now I want to borrow. We know that. We know what happens with the lag, and we know that it's coming. The second piece is that we've clearly had a major shift in the bargaining power of employees. So coming off of decades where you had, you know, globalization, so you could outsource the jobs, all of this, you know, deregulation, fewer and fewer labor unions, lower and lower corporate tax rates. We now have the tightest labor market in decades. Companies everywhere are raising wages and especially for lower incomes, especially the bottom 60, even 80% of people are seeing incomes go up faster rather than, you know, kind of those at the top seeing incomes go up. 
And we're really unlikely to get another push against corporate bargaining power from things like new globalization. We've already globalized every good. We can globalize a few other things. We were kind of at the peak pro-corporate environment. And now we see lots of pressures the other way. One example is every possible political proposal to address inequality in some way says, maybe you should raise corporate taxes. They're the lowest they've been in decades. So you're much more likely to move from very, very little antitrust regulation to more from very, very, very little, you know, kind of power in corporates and pressure on them to pay wages to some degree of more. The next thing is you have this inflationary environment and a lot of companies, not all, but a lot of companies will struggle to pass on that inflation to the consumers. And so when you basically look at what's happened in inflation, if everything is inflating at the same time, sort of magically, then all of your workers just have higher wages at the same time your prices are going up and they might not even notice it. Could be, you know, just my wages are going up and I'm paying more for stuff at the same time. But what's happening is that there are particular areas like fuel and oil and gas and food that are specifically inelastic and specifically have inflation. And generally, most consumers are not producers of that. They don't work at an oil company. And so especially for, call it the bottom 40, 60 percent of employees, they are really feeling their spending power hit by the rise in oil prices. They need to hit their homes. They need to drive places. And that eats into the corporate profit margins of people who are not oil producers thinking, can I really afford to raise prices into this environment where my customers are feeling this pain? Now, the last time this happened was 1970s. And of course, we had a lot of oil price pressures back then. And what you see when you look at the overall market is the overall stock market actually did great in terms of corporate profits. But back then, about 30% of the stock market was commodity producers. Today, it's more like 3%. So we have a lot fewer companies that are directly going to benefit from this inflationary environment and a lot more that are really going to struggle. The last thing I'll say in terms of pressure on corporates is that there's a lot of pressure on companies today to spend in ways that are not necessarily hugely profitable. So if in the past, every time you did capital expenditures, you could really see profits coming out the other end. Today, we're telling companies, well, maybe you want to spend actually for the resilience of your supply chain. Now, that's not exactly building a new supplier somewhere. That's saying, what if I have a problem? What if I can't be in China? What if there's a geopolitical conflict? We're telling them to spend to do things like decarbonize. That might not be very unprofitable, but it's not like you're expecting a huge boom in profitability when you switch over your company from being reliant on fossil fuels to not. So these are big areas of spend that at least are less like, not likely to uh, boost profits the way that prior investments were. Okay, I add that all up to say, look, Profits are extremely high, and it seems very unlikely they can remain this high at unprecedented levels forever. And I think the next obvious question is, but wait a minute, like, doesn't the market already know this? Doesn't the market already know that, you know, we're likely to have a slowing economy, and usually when the economy slows, COVID is a weird exception, you get slower profits. Doesn't the economy already know that there are geopolitical problems, that we have to shift away from uh, carbon in our economy, that all of these things are going to weigh and there's going to be deglobalization? How could this be new? And what I'd say is the good thing about public equities is you can see what's priced in pretty well. And broadly speaking, I do not think this is priced in. And so at a very high level, you could think about a stock as just a series of cash flows discounted to today. The cash flows are what do you think the profits will be? That's what we've been talking about. Will profits be high or low? And then they get discounted to today with two things, just what's the interest rate? How do I think about a cash flow 10 years from now, as well as the risk premium? Am I willing to handle taking risk on something 10 years into the future? And if you just say kind of back of the envelope, okay, if interest rates rose one and a half percent on a 10 year bond, and maybe you have a 10 year stream of earnings, that's a 15% equity decline. So when I look at equity prices, I'd say, broadly speaking, equities have basically fallen in line with the fact that rates have risen. That's it. That's all that happens. What that means is that two things have not gotten priced. The market is not expecting a very significant slowdown or a very significant change in the path of earnings for companies. That has not gotten priced in. And the second thing that has not gotten priced in is what we saw in the 70s, which is that when you have higher inflation, it's harder to manage the economy. Things get more volatile. And the reason that equities actually did terribly in the 1970s, worst decade ever, even though profits were good because you had all these resource companies, is that people demanded a higher risk premium to be in stocks in an inflationary environment when it was harder to control all that. This also hasn't gotten priced in today.
And so the market is not really reflecting a significant economic slowdown. It's kind of reflecting a beautiful Goldilocks scenario where the market kind of the economy barely slows, the Fed barely tightens enough, and magically inflation is good again. No one's worried about inflation in the future. The economy doesn't need to slow very much. And it's also pro processing a pretty magical scenario in terms of the United States. So to give some global perspective, U.S. companies are expected to continue doing better than any other companies in the rest of the world. And what that means is that either they have to have further higher profitability from already the highest we've ever seen, or they have to keep taking market share from other people. Now, it's not impossible, but it is difficult. And what we see in the past is this doesn't usually repeat itself, because once you have one decade where one country is really successful, in this case, the United States, these ten things tend to get priced into the price. People expect it to happen again. And then it's much easier to set up for disappointment than to outperform already incredibly high expectations. Hopefully that's good uh, background on how to think about corporate profitability. And back to you, and thanks for having me.